Okay, so sorry for this uh, slight uh, technical difficulty. We're back. We're too back many here. mics. Yeah, too many mics. I hope uh, you all can hear us well now. So what I was saying is that this quote really doesn't uh, represent what I think is uh, is true in our uh, in our world, in the world of uh, trying to um, push forward, put forward concepts to you so that you understand them. I'm very much uh, more in line with this one. Everything simple is false. If I sound, uh, if I sound well, if I, uh, if what I say uh, flows well, uh, it's because I'm hiding the truth behind the concepts, and I'm trying to, uh, and we, we're going to be trying to really define those concepts and make it hard for you to follow, because you have to, it has to be painful for you when you, when you're being talked into new words, into new, new concepts. Otherwise, you, you, you just don't get any value out of it, uh, and that's the, that's the main issue that we have with, uh, like CNBC, Bloomberg TV. They just talk about concepts without defining them. And that's really what we're going to do today. Our introduction is going to be about value of an asset um, and financial assets in particular, because that's what is of interest to you and how this value is being influenced by interest rates. So first off, um, let's start by the word value. Sounds easy to understand. And we're not talking about social values here, um, like principles. We're talking about economic values. So the worth of something, the worth of a go of goods, of services, and financial assets. So economics, um, as a discipline, tends to think that there is such thing as objective value. Um, so you know, Ron, there is this computer. It's an object. Mm -hmm. It has some worth independently from me or you, the subject. And according to mostly neoclassical uh, economists, you should have a way to value. So this is uh, this is good, but we could be talking about financial assets. You should add, you should have a framework to value some financial asset and equity of a corporation, equity ownership by following a theoretical framework that would give you the fair value. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's really conventional wisdom. I would say that's uh, uh, the orthodoxy among uh, financial analysts and economists. You could debate that. Uh, some uh, more uh, heterodox economists uh, will disagree. You know, uh, there are bubbles, and then the bubbles they blow up. Uh, that's that proves to you that there is no such in a, not such thing as interesting value that people agree on. But let's act as if this were completely true. And we'll try to walk you all through a simplified um, valuation framework that really mirrors, resembles a lot what is being done on Wall Street uh, and how financial analysts value financial assets. Let's do it. We have created the most uh, stylized financial asset possible. So here, mm. this asset is simply an envelope with a with one hundred dollar bill inside it, and so you want to value this thing. So the first case is very very easy, right? So if I go to Ron and I'm trying to sell this financial asset to him, uh, he's, he's probably going to guess very quickly that the fair price for this is a hundred dollars. But of course, I want to buy it for ninety nine bucks. So yes. Yeah. You want to buy it for ninety nine? I want to say it for one hundred one. Mm -hmm. We're not going to agree at this price, but the only fair price is going to be 100. Both of us are going to be happy. The exchange is going to be made. Now let's move forward with a similar financial asset, but still different. It's the same object, the same envelope with the same hundred dollar bill inside it. But I say different financial asset because right now I'm not offering it to you Ron, uh, as we speak. I'm promising that in a year from now, I'll give it to you. Mm. And I'm asking you, how much <clears> are you ready to pay for it? What do you think is the value of this financial asset, this new financial asset? And really here, like it sounds, I, I think it sounds very simple, very obvious, but we really are at the core uh, of valuation and objective value. So I hope uh, you all can follow very closely because that will be very important for the rest of the presentation. So now, Ron, if you're, if you're the buyer, you need more inputs. Um, you need to know, first off, what are your other opportunities? Uh, where can you park your dollars? So one of those inputs, I'm going to tell you, 
today you can also lend to the US government for a 2% interest rate. The other input you need is you need to know uh, how trustworthy I am. You need to know whether I'm really going to give it uh, to you in a year from now in order for you to buy it today. And let's assume I'm uh, a very wealthy uh, person. I'm as rich as a uh, Chris's and I have the same credit risk as the US government. So now we can have a discussion. Um, I would love for you to buy it again at $100 for me. Mm -hmm. But you're probably going to tell me, well, Alex, if I uh, put my $100 in the, uh, into the US Treasury, that is, if I lend it to the US government, in a year from now, I'll have $102. So now you start feeling that the value of this new financial asset is no longer $100. You're probably going to tell me, uh, well, I'm going to offer you $90, let's say. And, now, and then I'm going to tell you, well, some guys, they are lending to the US government. They make 2%. If you give me 90 and I give you 100 in a year, that's over 10% return for you. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's not good for me. I'm probably going to be able to find someone that's going to pay 98. Because if you give 98 to the government, you get 100 in a year. And so the only price we can agree on and that's very, very simple math here, is $98. Because that's my equivalent opportunity in the market. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. And if you had this $100 bill in your envelope today, mm -hmm. and you were going to give it to me a year from now, instead of selling it to me, you could just loan it to the government exactly. and make your 2%. Correct. Exactly. Okay. Now, a little bit uh, more complicated, but still quite simple. Different financial assets. I don't give it to you in a year from now, but in two years from now. We're going to have the same discussion. We're going to talk about the same things. And we're going to agree that the fair price now is 96 for the simple reason. The other opportunity for us in this simplified world is to lend to the US government, make 2% a year. So the fair price for this asset, a hundred dollar bill in two years from now is 96. So now we're going to slowly move from this abstract example to more of a real world um, application of it. If we show you this, um, this stream of envelopes, you might start to, uh, to figure out where we're going. There is a way if I go to Ron and tell him, I promise you a hundred dollars every year until I die or forever. Mm -hmm. Even my, my children will give this uh, to your children. There is a way as we just uh, did to value this new financial asset. What is Ron going to do is he is simply going to evaluate the worth of each of those envelopes is going to do the same work that we just did for each of them with different maturities. And it's going to figure out the year one envelope is worth 98, the year two 96 and so on and so on. And there's a simple uh, mathematical formula to summarize this sum. It's an infinite sum. So it's series, the convergent series. I won't uh, bore you with this uh, technical uh, concept, but in short, the value of this stream of envelopes, stream of cash flows in the future, is the value of one year uh, envelope, 100, divided by the opportunity cost, 2%. Mm -hmm. That is $5,000, 100 divided by 2%. And the opportunity cost that we're using in this example is just a hypothetical, uh, the interest that we could earn if we bought a US Treasury. Exactly. If we loaned money to the federal government. Exactly. Okay. Very simple world. Risk-free rate of return. Exactly. Yep. I'm risk-free. I'm going to give it for you to you for certain. Mm -hmm. And there's only one other opportunity, the U.S. government, simplified world. So now I'm going to, we're going to remove uh, the numbers from the slide. And we are just going to show you um, this example like in an, in, in an abstract way. You have those envelopes. I hope you've been bearing with us because maybe now you will start to realize that there is some uh, relationship some resemblance to equity ownership. So this is Target's logo. What is equity ownership? It's a promise from, a, not a certain promise, but some promise from a certain corporation to give you dividends until it ceases to operate, until bankruptcy or forever, if it never, if it never terminates operations. So that's, in a sense, the same concept. One envelope every year. And the value of that financial asset is in a way very similar to the formula we just used to value this $5,000 financial asset dividend 
So one hundred dollar bill every year. That's the dividend of Target every year. Every year for um, for Target, sorry. Divided by the interest rate. <clears throat> And this concept is really uh, critical and it's going to guide the whole presentation. So I know what people are going to be thinking because my initial thought when I see this is, but what about a company that, that is a quote unquote growth stock that is not paying dividends? Um, how does that play into this valuation formula? Exactly. So that's a more complicated uh, case, mm -hmm. but in a sense, it's still going to be the same uh, the same type of uh, of valuation frameworks. Only national analysts they will figure out the year from which um, said company is going to be profitable, mm. and they're going to apply a different interest rate uh, farther in the future. But the concept remains the same. For example, here we have Apple, which is already profitable, but we could have a company like Tesla, which is hardly profitable uh, today, and we would still be making the same point. Said point is the value of capital has something to do with the product of capital, the dividends adjusted by your opportunity cost, which cost is the of cost of capital. In the case of equity, it's <clears throat> dividend divided by interest rates. And now back to today, what's happening today, as you might have heard, and, and I hope now you understand why it's important, is that this ratio product of capital divided by cost of capital is moving a lot. The numerator dividends is going down, but mostly the denominator the opportunity cost interest rates is going up and up by a lot. So ratio denominator goes up by a lot, goes down. If the value goes down, returns or down. So I'm sure you're going to be getting into this, but uh, today market open target released earnings earnings uh top line revenue was growth they, they actually grew but due to inflationary costs uh profit margins were significantly lower than they were expecting which then would impact you know current and future dividends correct correct right and at the same time investors cost of capital their opportunity cost has been going up as interest rates have been going up Absolutely. so target's a great example for us right now of when you have the denominator going down and the interest rate going up exactly okay yeah the numerator, oh, the numerator yeah, down. Down. Yeah, and the numerator yep. and so as you said so now let's focus on it interest yes. rate the denominator goes up and this is going to be our first uh, first chart for this presentation here we show you um the interest rates on 10-year u.s treasury securities so-called t bonds adjusted by inflation rates hmm. for the first time in two years this yield is turning uh, is turning positive. Mm. That has huge implications on what we just discussed: the opportunity cost. A year ago, uh, if you were a large corporation trying to park your money somewhere, or a very wealthy individual, um, you were not able to lend at a risk-free rate to the government and make more than inflation. Today, you are. So if today you are a large pension fund or a large corporation and you can make a very safe investment, allegedly risk-free, unless the US government defaults, you can make this investment and earn more than inflation. Your opportunity cost is much higher for, for valuing equities. You're much less willing to risk your dollars into investments that have no guarantee to make you more than inflation. So this, this chart and this plot here is extremely um, consequential um, as far as uh, equity stocks, equity stocks, equity returns are concerned today. Let's look at a similar chart, uh, sim similar data point over a much longer time period. So we're still talking about 10 year US treasury securities simply we're not adjusting for inflation anymore so this is the straight nominal yield so the return that you make by lending to the us government for 10 years over the past 40 years this has been um, the most obvious and most critical and consequential again trend in the world of finance so since the 1980s the yield on us government securities has been steadily 
going down up to a point where it almost reached zero percent for 10 years so there are lots of reasons uh, for this uh, i think it's still very interesting to to mention them uh, this has been called secular stagnation um, the reasons why interest rates and yields have been going down for 40 years except for today that's what we're going to discuss uh, mm -hmm. in a few minutes are uh, threefold or maybe four reasons even the first is digitalization so when companies are moving from an industrialized world in economic uh, in, uh, in developed economies to a more digitalized world they need to make much less investment or much less expensive investment into capital goods so 50 years ago in order to produce profits for your shareholders you had to build a plant uh, you had to buy machinery Ext extremely expensive today you have three de three developers and uh, and two computers you have a company mm. so the demand for money from companies in order to invest into capital is much lower and again a concept that's very important to understand interest rates uh, and that I think people uh, define uh, less often than they should. What is an interest rate? It's an equilibrium price between supply of money and demand for money. Hmm. Supply of money being savings, people have money on the side, and demand of money uh, is investment requirements from companies in particular. So as I just said, if the economy is more digital and let, needs less money, well, then the demand for savings is lower. Um, so the interest rate that is the equilibrium between demand and supply is going to go down. Second reason uh, is aging of population. So this has been a, a long trend as well in the US in particular, as well as across Europe, Japan. More people into retirement uh, means less people to, to produce. Uh, and also work. So same type of argument, if companies have uh, you know, uh, less workers, they produce less uh, for the economy, so they invest less, the demand for investment uh, is lower. Interest rates that you pay to get people's, people's money are going to be lower. Um, there, are the, there, there are many more reasons. So for example, uh, and, and I'm not going, going to go to details here, but the middle class are being sort of uh, hollowed out, much and more, more and more reduced um, as the effect of also bringing uh, in like yields down. Uh, quick reason is because um, if you have more very wealthy people, those on average tend to spend less compared to their income than middle class people. So <laughs> less demand for companies' products on average, uh, less demand for investments. Again, same arguments, uh, demand for money goes down price of money goes down, the price being interest rates. So this slide, we took, uh, we took some time to look at it because today there seems to be the beginning of a reversal. And that's really what everybody uh, is, uh, is talking about and discussing and debating and trying to predict uh, what is going to happen, which we're not going to do. But at least it's very important to recognize this spike. So that's really the, the very uh, at the bottom right of this chart, we are crossing this trend. <clears throat> As for the reasons uh, why, for the first time, we are trying to, we are, we are kind of breaking this trend. This next chart is the explanation. Here, you have the 12 month um, percent change in inflation mm -hmm. for the average urban consumer. So, of course, um, not all US consumers will face the same, uh, uh, let's say, inflation issue. This is an average urban consumer. If you are less urban, more um, peri-urban, rural, you're going to use more, more gasoline. Uh, you're going to do more building maybe around your house. Uh, and we know uh, basic materials and energy are the main items. Higher. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So your rate uh, of inflation for your basket of consumption is going to be different, and maybe your rate is going to be even higher than that. But we still need a baseline, and the baseline is the following. We have the fastest acceleration in inflation 
in over 40 years. As to why this is very important for interest rates and yields, consider the following. What is inflation? Again, important concept. Inflation reduces um, your, purchasing, your purchasing power in the future. So the higher inflation, the less you're going to be able to consume in a year, two years, three years from now, as opposed to if you were buying those goods or services today. Well, if that happens, you are much more uh, incentivized to consume today at a cheaper price. If you consume today, well, you have less money to invest. Less money to invest means less demand for the financial assets that are currently here, which means, uh, again, uh, yields can go up. When prices go down, yields go up. So that's the essence um, of this concept and why inflation is bringing rates uh, up overall. One thing that's pretty um, encouraging, but not absolutely uh, um, thrilling, is what has happened in April. So this chart is basically the same data as the previous one, but with a narrower focus on more uh, current events. You have uh, the dark blue plot is overall inflation. The light blue is so-called core inflation, where you adjust by removing the more volatile items like energy and food. What happened in April is that for the first time in, in some quarters, the rate of inflation didn't accelerate. So that's a so-called secondary derivative um, became negative. Um, it's still uh, very high, but it's sort of a relief to see that maybe, not certain, that maybe uh, we have seen uh, the worst of inflation. Like the peak is behind us. Don't quote me on this. This is not a prediction. Uh, this is what I would say the average market participant thinks today. Still, the average dollar invested into the market prices things, implying that we have seen the peak in inflation. And an important thing here, you and I were talking about this offline last night. And, and I talked to a lot of clients and advisors around the country that I think it's really important to state that what we're talking about here with CPI is the rate of change. It's not the actual change in a price of a good, right? So when we're looking at this, we're saying, okay, the average rate of change for the last 12 months for this basket of goods and services has been 8.2%. It doesn't mean that price has declined from last month or last quarter, right? So if last month the inflation number was 8.6 and now we're 8.2, it doesn't mean people actually suffer relief and had prices go down. That the rate of price increasing slowed down slightly. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly it. So that's more important for the financial analysts and the investors mm -hmm. than for the consumers. Because, of course, as you just say, consumers still see prices uh, going up. But what's important for uh, people evalu evaluating assets? Specialists, it's the trend, hmm. and this is the trend. One other trend they're looking at, and I would say that's the most uh, uh, observed data point, also by the Fed, uh, regarding inflation. Much more important to them than two days inflation, like two days rate of increase in prices compared to a year ago. This is five year, five year in inflation. End quote. So. It's a pretty uh, intricate concept again. So let me read the definition verbatim. This measures the expected inflation rate on average over a five-year period that will start five years from now. So this is going to be the average inflation rate if we're in 2022 mm -hmm. in 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, the average. So it's the expected inflation rate starting five years from now yes. and then running for a period of five years. Yes. Okay. So two reasons why uh, financial persons look at this. The first, if you remember the way we uh, try to evaluate uh, our very simplified uh, financial asset, you have a stream of cash flows that defines the value of an asset today, while you have more cash flows in the future than you have today. So really, if you want to value this, you care more about future inflation than today's.
The second reason, more precisely, the reason why it's five year, five year, is because the assets used to reverse engineer this expected inflation rate are the US 10 year, US Treasury 10 year securities and the five year securities, which are extremely liquid, uh, which makes up for a pretty re reliable data point. So the takeaway from this slide is twofold again. One, there is an increase indeed in expected inflation. We no longer are in a regime where inflation is really lagging, uh, is still uh, below 2%, uh, so-called like almost deflationary environment, or at least disinflationary. We are into a new regime where we are heading towards two, two and a half percent. The second takeaway is just this. We're not 5%, we're not 10%, we're two and a half percent. So the second takeaway is this, the market still expects the Fed to be able to bring inflation back under control. And now let's move back to uh, our more abstract exercises from the beginning. So we talked about targets. Now I'm going to, uh, to take Apple as an example. Um, we're trying to really give you a feeling, really sense, so that you can sense uh, why inflation and interest rates matter. So this is the illustration for Apple's um, equity ownership. What is it? It's a, a stream of future dividends. Apple is a growing company still, so those dividends get bigger and bigger over time. Um, so we make a lot of simplifications here in, in our computations, but that's, that's just the broad idea. The two important data points are dividends, interest rates. So we give you those assumptions here. Remember the formula, product of capital adjusted by cost of capital. The question you want to ask is what was the value of Apple, uh, simplified Apple here, in 2021 before rates went up? Well, if, if we assume interest rate was 2%, you have the formula D divided by R. 20, if you assume the dividend is 20, divided by 2%, that's $1,000. So in our stylized example, Apple is worth 1,000. Was worth 1,000 in 2021. Mm -hmm. Now we move to 2022, when we have new assumptions. The cost of capital is no longer 2%. I assume it is 3% now. Same question. In this new world, what's the value of our simplified Apple stock? 20 divided by 3% this time, it's 667. So you had something worth 1,000 and now 667. That gives you a, a, an idea of uh, what the return is. It's extremely negative. It's 33% down. That's really what you, you have to keep in mind. So those numbers, of course, are assumptions and simplifications. But when you look at the reality, that's really what's happening with Apple stock today. And so this chart shows you the year-to-date return of Apple is down almost 16% as of yesterday's close. And Apple is still one of, if not the most profitable company. Yes. It has hundreds of billions of dollars of just net free cash sitting yes. on its balance sheet. It's still growing. Yes. And its stock is down 16%. Yes. Okay. So this Probably is a right. question that our advisors get asked by you guys, clients a lot um, and, and prospects, which is oftentimes this, everybody has this desire to try and understand like, why did the value of XYZ stock, Apple stock, why did it go down? Uh, a friend of mine just took his company public and uh, over the last couple of months, the price of their stock has gotten absolutely hammered, even though they've released earnings that have shown growth and profitability growth since they've gone public, yeah. right? But the reality is it doesn't even have anything to do, it has something to do with the individual company metrics, but it is being dramatically impacted by the cost of capital, by the interest rate increase that the market is applying to these calculations. Absolutely. They're not happening in a vacuum. It's not like every one of these stocks is impacted completely separate of each other, right? This cost of capital, this risk-free rate that's used in these calculations is impacting equities across the board. Yes, okay. very true. Great. And across the board is the, the right word here, the right expression, because on the same slide, uh, we have the whole board. 
So you can see across the board here, um, the red plot is uh, a world equity index, MSCI, and the light blue plot is the broad uh, large cap market in the USA, S&P 500. And the other blue plot is uh, the darker one, is R large cap strategy at Life Works, diversified premium. So it almost shows up on my screen black, but so the black line is LifeWorks Diversified Premier, yes. which is our flagship equity strategy. Light blue line is the S&P 500. And then you have Apple uh, in there as the dark blue line. Here is the royal blue line, just as comparison. Yep. Okay. So to quote you, this is not <laughs> happening in a vacuum. All of those uh, financial assets are impacted by the same thing. Those rates going up. That's the reason why we spent some time uh, trying to uh, redefine this concept very well to you guys. Um, because you see the correlation between those returns this year is extremely high. Those four plots, they move together. There are small differences, and we could uh, boast about uh, our strategy being done only by 12, but the market is done by 14. Um, but that's really not the point here. Uh, you would have to uh, do some very deep analysis to figure out whether it was skills or luck. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, that's, that's the takeaway. The broad equity market uh, is going down. So by the way, just a disclaimer, 11.9% negative return for LifeWorks uh, core equity strategy really uh, applies to our single equity version, so individual equities. Mm -hmm. So if you have uh, an ETF version of it, you might have uh, different returns. Mm -hmm. Let's move back to our abstract example. There are two points we really wanted to make today. The first point was when rates go up, financial asset prices tend to go down. I think it's been pretty- All things being equal. All things being yes. equal, simplified yes. assumptions. And I think this has been made pretty clear uh, by now. The second point that we really wanted to make is that not all financial assets will go down, will go down to the same extent. And so here we will again run you all through some numerical examples and simplified assumptions to give you a sense, to give you a feeling uh, why some assets would go down more than others. And so let's stick to Apple. Apple is particular in that it's still growing. And so there is a, a concept that is called duration that tells you a number. And this number is the average point in time in the future when Apple receives their cash flows, or rather distributes them to shareholders as dividends. So for a company, for example, that will, uh, the envelope, the one year envelope, the duration is one year. The average point in time when you receive this cash flow is a year. A single envelope that I'll give you in a hundred years, the duration would be 10 years. Apple, a lot of cash today already, but a lot of cash expected also in the future. So in this very simplified example, we assume the duration is 10, um, the average point in time when Apple distributes dividends is 10 years from now. And now we're trying to value this average, quote unquote, dividend uh, in 10 years. So remember uh, our uh, uh, very first slides when I was uh, setting, a, uh, for example, a two year uh, bond, almost a two year fixed income security program. It was compounding interest twice, right? So it was dividing 100 by one plus, plus 2% twice mm -hmm. squared. Now year 10, the formula is the same, except that you compound interest 10 times to find the, the fair value of this dividend. So in 2021, you want to value a dividend that's gonna be received in 10 years. The dividend is 20, 2021 rate we assumed was 2%. You ask the question again, what is the value? Plug in numbers, 20 divided by 1.02 power of 10, tells you that this dividend in 2021, before this uh, rate uh, spike, spike was $16.4. New question now. Well, in 2022, I changed one assumption. The rate is no longer 2%, it's 3%. Mm -hmm. Same formula, different inputs. The same dividend is worth less because opportunity cost goes up, cost of capital goes up, 14.9. Um, What's interesting and what you need to keep in mind here is the rate of decrease here. It's about 10% lower. 
So if I increase the interest rates in our simplified world by 1%, the average Apple dividend is 10% less valuable. So remember this number, 10% for Apple, which uh, let's say it's the average S&P 500 company. Now we are going to look at a specific company, Target, and we're going to do the exact same exercise. The difference being Target is not growing as fast as Apple is. And so the average point in time where one is going to receive or distribute its average dollar through dividends is not in 10 years from now. It's closer to now because today's dividends are almost the same as they're going to be in 10 years. So let's assume quote unquote duration is now five years, not 10. Same formula. How much was this five year dividend, this year five dividend worth last year? when rates we assumed were 2%. Formula tells you 18.1. Same exercise, moving to 2022, rates go up, so plus 1%. The new value of the same dividend, the five-year dividend, the year five dividend, has gone down from 18.1 to 17.3. But what is very important to notice is that this decrease has not been as significant. It is only 5% less valuable as opposed to 10. So we hope uh, these concepts are pretty clear uh, right now in the relationship between duration, rate, and value starts to make sense to you. And now we're going to move back to the performance chart. So we have the same plots here the broad market strategies. I'm going to set colors that are less uh, visible because we're not going to focus on them anymore. But now I'm going to plot the year to date return of target that we just discussed. As you might expect, and if uh, we were clear enough in our abstract examples, if the main factor is rates and the duration of target is lower, then you expect target to not be down by as much, mm. which is what happens. It's only down by 6.6% .6 as of yesterday. Mm. And now let's take companies or financial assets that are similar to targets in that sense, that they do not grow as fast, so their dividends are closer in time mm. to us and duration is lower. <clears throat> and they may be more broadly speaking, lumped into things that we would call value stocks or consumer defensive, something exactly. like that. Right? Exactly so it's there. companies, Coca-Cola, Walmart, Johnson & Johnson, Target, things like that. Exactly. Correct? Okay. And so those four companies you just named, they're part of this ETF, for example. The Fidelity Value ETF, the blue plot, is down. As we say, the rates go up, prices go down, but not by as much. So this broad value ETF is down 9%. And our uh, own value slash quality strategy at LifeWorks, investing in more resilient, more stable companies is up this year. Mm. So you see, we are, uh, we are looking at uh, financial assets of a different nature here. Mm. And all of them have been hurt less by rates. So the takeaway yeah. here when I'm looking at this, <clears throat> and this is a question, this is a question that we get asked all the time right? Which is how is my investments performing relative to the market, right? And so one thing that we try and do when we're answering the question is define what the market is, because just using the Dow Jones or using the S&P 500 might not actually be representative of a good comparison to that investment. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So LifeWorks Diversified Premier Strategy, which a lot of you watching have as part of your customized, personalized portfolio, has two main, let's say, kind of components to it, right? One of them is quality, which is what we're looking at now. That is a focus on equities that have cash flow streams that are expected to be received sooner, right? Um, that are not quote unquote growth companies that have profits that are paying dividends, et cetera. That portion of our diversified premia strategy is actually up for the year. Now, if we just compared that to the S&P 500, it would make us look like absolute geniuses, but it's not truly a fair comparison because the S&P 500 has companies in it like Tesla, which has no profitability and the value of it is mostly dependent on 
it's achieving its future growth rate projections, right? And eventually paying dividends or returning capital to the investors. Exactly. Yeah. And this is a great transition because the next company we're going to look at, back to our abstract example, no, Tesla. is Tesla. Tesla is different from Target and Apple in that they hardly make any profits today, but they expect to make a huge amount of profit in the future um, should they dominate mm -hmm. this uh, electric vehicle market one day and should they make it uh, uh, profitable for them. So we're not going to spend too big shirts. Yeah, too big shirts. Too big shirts. Yeah, too big shirts. No assumptions. One, yeah, no one knows yet. Um, we're not going to spend as much time on the calculation, but the essence is the same. The duration is much higher. A 1% increase in interest rates will make their average future dividend 30% less valuable, mm -hmm. as opposed to 10% in our simplified example for Apple, 5% for Target. So let's get back to our performance chart. And now you, I think you can guess already before I show you where the Tesla plot is going to show. Removing those uh, visible colors, and then you have Tesla here. I have to squeeze <laughs> the vertical axis for a good reason. Tesla is down by a lot. Mm. And another asset in the same real is done by even more, which is the ARK ETF. Mm, the ARK Innovation ETF. Got it. And that, that ETF is, you selected that one, it owns a lot of technology companies mm -hmm. and companies that are maybe long-term future bets on their viability. Exactly. Right. And exactly. just as a disclaimer, we don't own it in our portfolios. We're not saying it's a good investment, bad investment. There is lots of news out there, uh, pros and cons as it relates to Kathy Wood's ARK strategies. Alex just selected it because it is a good one uh, as, as an example in this conversation. Exactly. We do not, we do not own it. <laughs> And it's done by a lot, 50% uh, uh, almost. Or even more than 50% year to date. So we have Tesla, 30%. This uh, very risky slash uh, innovation ETF down more than 50%. We have a light blue plot, which is the Fidelity Growth ETF as opposed to value, down about 30% year to date as well. And the last plot is our own version uh, of more aggressive, uh, optimistic, ambitious uh, equity strategies called LifeWorks Opportunity, done more than the risk premium, which is done more than quality. So opportunity is down almost 18% for the year. Doing better than uh, some of uh, the growth counterparts here, but still done by a lot due to longer duration. And now we're going to look at this chart with a different uh, perspective in mind. So in green, I have the shorter duration assets that we have discussed. Target, mm -hmm. quality strategy at LifeWorks, value ETF. In yellow, we have the medium uh, type of duration, the broad market, S&P 500, LifeWorks, Direct Premier. Premium. And in red, we have uh, the assets we just discussed, the Cathy Woods uh, arcs of the world, life first opportunity in Tesla. And I hope you start um, um, enjoying the fact that the only concept we've uh, talked about so far, interest rates, cost of capital, is what explains 95% of the returns today. I have three colors for different versions, different values of uh, cost of capital for different companies. And that tells you which one was up this year or slightly down, which one was down by more and which one was down by a lot. So we spent a lot of time on this concept for a good mm -hmm. reason. It tells you everything about what's happening today. Mm -hmm. And we can go even further. We can move out of the equity space into bonds, fixed income. Mm -hmm. Fixed income is a stream of cash flow that you can value with the same type of framework. And if I pick one example, an ETF called TLT, those are very short, uh, no, not short, very long duration uh, bonds, more than 20 year um, US treasury securities mostly. So what would you expect? Well, if I plot it right here, it's done by a lot. 
So just and just to be really clear, because uh, I think this is an important concept, mm -hmm. right? I know we only have maybe 10, 15 minutes left. We're probably going to run a couple minutes over. So for those of you guys watching, um, we're probably going to go about five to 10 minutes over. Hopefully uh, that's okay. Um, the TLT ETF that Alex has plotted up here in the bright red line, that is an ETF that owns 20-year constant maturity U.S. treasuries. So the concept of a risk-free rate of return and that owning U.S. treasuries is a risk-free rate of return is not necessarily true when you're talking about price movement. Exactly. Right? If you bought a 20-year bond today and held it for 20 years until maturity, the overwhelming agreement in the market is that the U.S. government can't default on their debt because they can print more money, and you're going to earn your coupon rate, the interest, plus your original principal back. But in between today when you buy it and some point you know when it gets to maturity if you needed to sell that bond today your basket of etfs your safest fixed income bucket or safer fixed income allocation would be down almost 23 percent yes two-thirds of the way to where tesla's at yes doesn't sound like risk free does it five <laughs> percent further decline in value than the lifeworks opportunity strategy mm -hmm. 22.2 percent further decline in value than the LifeWorks quality strategy. So I'm sure you're gonna dive into this more, but I just wanted to pause there a second because again, at the advising level, we get asked questions by our clients, you guys and, and people all the time, right? About the ability of fixed income to provide some downside protection, right? And this year, and I won't steal the, the thunder of your presentation, but this is a great example that a lot of people are feeling, mm -hmm. right? Where they own something that was perceived to be fairly risk-free or riskless, and they're seeing negative 10, 20% uh, year-to-date returns on it. So yeah. anyway, keep going. I just thought that was an important concept to pause on a second. Um, great, uh, no, no, great. Uh, great concepts and, uh, and indeed, uh, you are not safe if you're holding an ETF. Uh, that's, that's going to be priced daily. <laughs> Yep. you have to hold it into maturity. So same factor, duration, uh, moving to a lo little lower duration. So let's call it medium term. The AG, which is a representation of uh, the average bond market in the US, the duration is much, much lower, still down by a lot, 10.4% down. As Ron said, fixed income, not really, not really risk-free here. Same factor duration but now the shortest duration possible basically you're lending to the u.s government with a one month maturity it's basically flat for the year mm -hmm. losing 20 bips 0.20 percent mm -hmm. so we've seen here over the past 40 minutes that this denominator is defining all the all the returns today most of the returns today meaning the most significant impact more than likely to the valuation of financial assets, stocks, bonds. I'm going to say real estate, although we haven't, maybe that one's a little bit harder to talk about, but the impact to the valuation of financial assets has been significantly driven. Probably the most important yeah. factor has been the fastest rate of increase in yields that we've seen in 40 years. Yes, very true. And it's true also of our real estate, as you mentioned. Yeah. So now moving back to our ratio, uh, product of capital divided by uh, cost of capital. We've covered cost of capital. We are going to briefly cover uh, product of capital. So if we take uh, equity ownership, for example, we are talking about dividends here. Mm -hmm. um, dividends, by definition, are a share of a company's profits that depend on the company's revenues adjusted by costs. Revenues, they basically on average, if you take the overall market, mm -hmm. they would grow like the economy. Mm -hmm. So like the gross domestic product of the United States. And today there is a lot of uncertainty about economic growth. Three paths are to be considered. Three with, possible outcomes. Three possible yep. outcomes. It's impossible today to say which one mm -hmm. is going to materialize. If you happen to hire a financial advisor that knows, or happen to look at, uh, to watch CNBC uh, in your evenings and, and, and listen to someone who knows, they're charlatans. They have no clue whether we're going to have a soft landing, 
an imminent recession or recession in two years from now or stagflation by the way stagflation for what six months three years five years a decade we don't know <clears throat> we don't know however it's very important to understand what each of these um, possible outcome mm. entails and first of all means so we're going to give you a proper definition because we like definitions here and concepts as you've, as you've noticed and we'll start by soft lending by the way each of these three outcomes can be defined across three concepts economic growth inflation and interest rates so you'll see the connections here what is soft lending i'm going to read my definition verbatim the federal reserve and other central banks in the world of course would succeed in bringing inflation our first concept under control quicker than most anticipate today and they don't have to raise rates rates second concept as far or as high as many now fear while growth or third concept slows down but never dips into uh, an outright recession mm -hmm. so summary again what is soft lending if it happens rates do not go so high growth doesn't happen to be so low doesn't go negative doesn't go negative mm -hmm. And the inflation is brought back under control and it's pretty low, back to 2%, for example, or 2.5. I will not ascribe a specific probability to that scenario, um, but the probability is growing, it's going lower and lower. Second state of the world, recession. Here is the new definition. The Fed's tightening squeezes the light the life out of the economy swiftly first concept growth even as it brings inflation under control second concept as a result rates do not rise as much as feared three and instead central bank central banks have to pivot yet again and start easing so summary here the rates they do not go so high in fact they would be lowered by central banks in the short term or shortly after the recession happens to boost the economy again. The economic activity would contract. So you would have unemployment rates go up. You would have revenues of companies go down. And as far as inflation is concerned, you would most certainly have deflation mm -hmm. in the short term. And the third one is uh, stagflation. So what is stagflation from today on, if it happens? First concept, inflation would keep rising despite central banks' best efforts, and that means rates also keep rising. And inflation combines with high rates to destroy demand. So the economy basically submerges. So rates go very high, economic activity comes to a standstill or even contracts periodically, and you have extremely high inflation with everything that that entails erosion of uh, trust between uh, market participants, erosion of a uh, social fabric almost. Mm -hmm. But we don't know. We don't know which one is going to happen. And none of these uh, should be excluded. In fact, um, the two most consequential factors are extremely unpredictable and out of central bank's control. These are first economic activity in China today due to the lockdowns that they had to implement again because of uh, COVID spreading again. And the second one is the war in Ukraine. Of course, the US Central Bank has very little influence on that. If the COVID-driven uh, disruptions in China continue and the war goes on and on, the prospect of a soft ending is almost, uh, almost uh, impossible. Well, and that's the I mean, <clears throat> history has shown us that the Federal Reserve and central banks, as as one would expect if you stopped and thought about it, right? Trying to control, trying to centrally control an economy, especially a global economy, right? With as many unique factors and participants and levers that are going on, any single entity, I think, uh, I would not be willing to make a bet that any single entity could pull a lever 
and accurately control something as dynamic as the global economy, mm -hmm. right? So I think history maybe does lend some insight into when the Federal Reserve has taken certain actions. They have seen the results they want, but it maybe hasn't happened how they wanted it, right? So this idea of a soft landing, you know, Alex wrote a really great piece a week ago that if you didn't see it in your email, uh, message your advisor or message us, we'll happy to get it to you. It's called Markets Should Be Demystified. And it actually spends a fair amount of time, I think, laying out the logical argument for why, you know, talking heads, financial analysts, other advisors that make predictions, like you should buy, you know, commodities right now because inflation is going to get out of control. They have a 50-50 shot of being right. But then if you go to the next year and say, what's the probability of them being right two times in a row, you have a 50% probability of the 50% probability that they were right. Right. So that piece that we put out that Alex wrote, really fantastic. I'd encourage you to read it to understand um, why we are not making a prediction. We're trying to give a, a reasonable explanation of the possible paths. And then Alex will wrap up here in a second talking about how we are approaching navigating this potential end of an economic cycle. Right. Um, so anyway, kind of back to it, I just, thought I just thought I would pause there for a second because this idea that that there is an entity, and I think it, you know it's maybe a U.S. thing. We tend to put a lot of oh, you know, Europe kind of too. like Europe too. We tend to put a lot of like Superman esque qualities into, into institu institutions, like believing that the president of the United States can somehow like massively impact you know certain things like the economy or baby supply, you know, baby formula shortages, things like this. Right? There's there's maybe a uh, an undue expectation for the impact that an entity or an individual or an institution could have on something as dynamic as the U.S. economy. Absolutely, and uh, from because of that reason, extremely hard um, to predict what is going to happen, and I would even say worthless to try and make a bet. Mm. So, if you were to make a bet on a recession happening, you would have to position your assets in a certain way, and you would do, you would destroy value. Because if it doesn't happen, um, then you 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 made the wrong uh, the wrong allocation. What is, however, very interesting is to try and understand in each of these uh, three cases what type of assets, what type of asset classes uh, would benefit or would suffer. And that's that, by the way, is going to be um, the subject of uh, of our next uh, so-called uh, lunch and learn mm -hmm. session that we're going to uh, to have next week. So for about an hour, an hour and a half. I will uh, I will discuss uh, that topic. For example, if tax collection happens, where uh, are the best assets and the worst? Recession same, soft landing same. That doesn't mean that we are allocating our strategies and our clients' money based on those predictions. Mm -hmm. That only means that we have it in mind and that we consider it when we build our overall what we call resilient portfolio. That is the portfolio that we think. Um, in any state of the world doesn't jeopardize your ability as a, as a client and a consumer uh, to live the life you want to live. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why what we make a front and center here at LifeWorks is you being the right benchmark. Mm -hmm. We have a portfolio that's resilient. Let's see how we can tilt it uh, towards more risk or more conservative uh, assets depending on what your financial plan is. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, all right, you know, Ron, I'm pretty certain next year we're going into stagflation. You're and, wrong. And I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, that's what the uh, vast majority of uh, TV commentators or economists or even unfortunately financial advisors think is valuable. They think it's valuable to try and predict the path of the economy. So final thoughts. We are in a, uh, in a situation that is, uh, that is uh, really unprecedented. That sounds like a, a, a very uh, common, th a common theme, but we have to uh, explain why is the case. The current um, economic regime we are in today dates back, I would say, to the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So any data before the 19 1980s, and by this I mean 70s type of stagflation, is to me worthless. What has happened since then? mostly in the 1980s, we now no longer have any barriers to capital flows and outflows, barriers to trade. We ha we've had neoliberalism in the 19 1980s, still going on today. 
Uh, that means independent central banks focus on different things that what they were focused on in the 60s and 70s. Uh, we've had stagnation of, uh, of wages for the middle class compared to productivity growth and, and, and financial assets uh, returns. So we really are in a world uh, where anything before that period is irrelevant. And so we see a lot of uh, commentators and a lot of analysts trying to figure out what is going to happen based on what happened in the, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. But it's a different wrong. world. Different. It's a completely different, different world. world. Yeah. Different world. And so, in that context, we have received a lot of questions before uh, that market update. So we obviously didn't have the time to uh, answer 20, 25 questions. What I will do is I is I will respond individually to each of your uh, emails uh, to the specific question you asked, and I will touch on uh, on that subject, for example, because that was part of uh, of the questions. But apart from that, expect. Uh, uh, an email from us on the, on the launch and learning opportunity next week and uh, and more especially yeah so the yeah. launch and learn opportunity is something that um, and we say lunch uh, we've got clients scattered across the US in different time zones um, one of the things that we are going to start doing is the week following one of these market updates where obviously we cover a lot of economic stuff I mean we covered some basic valuation math but very very important to understand why the broad markets are down, why the financial asset markets are down. So next week, Thursday, and again, for everybody that registered for this um, market update webinar, and those of you that are watching right now, expect an email from us by tomorrow morning, where there will be an invite to a Zoom uh, interactive presentation, where you can have your camera and your mic on, you can be asking questions directly to Alex and his team. Um, each of those, uh, there's going to be three of them. There's going to be one at noon Eastern time, one at 3 p.m. Eastern time, and one at 6 p.m. Eastern time to cover the different time zones. And they're going to be limited to 25 participants, that there is plenty of time to make sure that if you have specific questions about, you know, why is gold behaving the way it's behaving? A question we get asked all the time, like, is gold truly a store of value and protection against inflation? Like this year, no, mm -hmm. so far. Right. Uh, we'll be able to go into those in uh, in more detail. So, so be watching for that. That'll be out tomorrow morning. Um, and I think you've got maybe one more. Do you have one more slide? Maybe no, I think not? we're done. I okay. think uh, we've had enough uh, enough concepts for the day. Enough numbers. Uh, enough abstract ideas. Everybody's eyes have rolled <laughs> into the back of their heads. They don't want to see dividend over rates anymore. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe share my quick final thoughts as we're um, winding down. We're about ten minutes late. Again. Everybody wants to know and wants to find some certainty, especially in a market that is feeling like it's increasingly more and more uncertain, right? Know that the work that Alex and his team and that all of us here at LifeWorks are doing to build durable and resilient investment strategies that then can be personalized to each one of you watching. So everybody watching has a different portfolio. There is no one model portfolio here at LifeWorks where everybody has the same flavor of ice cream. But building resilient strategies and forming it with, you know, deep thinking, critical thinking, scientific processes is really, really important. And the results are showing. So our quality strategy was never designed to outperform the S&P 500. But in times of market turbulence, right, things that are consumer staples, things that are uh, companies that people are going to be buying products from, regardless of what the economic regime is or what the financial market looks like, right, are holding up well. Right. I was asked yesterday on a phone call with one of our clients. It was a very valid question. He said, Ron, I'm sitting on some cash. Uh, is now a good time to put it in the market? We get asked this. Our advisors get asked this question all the time. My response to him was this. Do you need the money tomorrow? No. Do you need the money a year from now? If your business was to take a turn uh, for the negative, do you need the money to maybe float your salary in the event that happened? No. Okay. I said, look, if you leave it in cash, we can see right now that inflation has been, you know, significantly elevated, you know, uh, you know, when you're talking seven, eight, who knows what the next inflation print's going to be, uh, year over year growth in inflation, that is a negative impact to purchasing power, which means your money sitting in cash is just a guaranteed loser, right? So I said, my advice to you, Mr. Client, is to deploy money into the market based on when you need to spend the money. And if you don't need the money tomorrow and you don't need it a year from now, and you probably realistically don't need it five years from now, the highest probability we have of protecting your purchasing power and growing those dollars to have a positive real rate of return is to invest them in equities. 
And that's the right decision. That is not a blanket statement that one could make, like now is a great time to deploy capital. Is it the bottom of the market? Who knows? Should we be rushing out there buying Target because Target's beat up today? Who knows? LifeWorks is not market timers. Uh, we are not the industry charlatans that Alex has now labeled uh, in that great piece he wrote called Market Should Be Demystified. You're not going to hear us making predictions. We're not going to say something like, well, maybe dollar cost average in. Buy a little today, wait till tomorrow and see what happens. That's all that's all industry jargon and irrelevance to you and your situation. So we're going to continue. Uh, we're going to try and do another one of these market updates in about 30 days. We're going to try and pick up the pace in a little bit um, and then have these very highly interactive lunch and learn uh, sessions with Alex. And we'll also have other members of the team and covering different topics. So be looking out for that. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. I hope it challenged you uh, to think a little bit that you, even in the simple examples of valuation, right? Um, why it's almost impossible for any individual to give an accurate prediction of where the market's going to be a year from now or where the value of an asset's going to be a year from now. Right? I mean, we took the S&P 500 and your, your market should be demystified piece. And you're like, look, to actually accurately predict the value of the S&P 500, you not only have to do these calculations on 500 companies, but then you have to take in interest rate considerations, currency considerations, the economic conditions, and it's geopolitical geopolitical risk. conditions. Uh, it's almost an impossibility. We wanted today, and as Alex built this presentation, you know, he really and and, and I agree with this. Wanted to communicate to you guys some fundamental learning, right, around why financial assets have been broadly impacted as interest rates are going up. Why the market prices in inflation and prices in the interest rate change before the Federal Reserve does it, right? And why as you're looking across the, the markets and we see gold down and cryptocurrencies down and equities down and real estate valuations down and treasuries down, the underlying factors that drive it. Now is not the time to panic. There's no reason for that. Um, but now is also not the time that we're going to be making some kind of predictions like everybody should go from this asset to this mm -hmm. asset and we should go on. You're never going to hear us do things like that. So from uh, all of us here at LifeWorks, Alex, you did an awesome job of the presentation. Thank you for putting that together. Uh, be watching for an email from us tomorrow morning with an invite to three different uh, interactive sessions with Alex and his team next week. Um, and also be watching your emails for those of you that submitted questions. There's about 25 of you that submitted detailed questions. We're going to reply to those on a one-on-one -on -one basis because we didn't have enough time to do it on today's market update. Closing thoughts? It was a pleasure introducing those concepts. Now I hope, uh, I mean, if ever someone uh, walks to you and uh, sells you uh, an envelope with dollars, <laughs> at least uh, you, know to, you know to price it. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, answering your question next week. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you so much again for being here. Sorry we ran a little bit late. Uh, God bless and have a great rest of your week. God bless.